Hey everyone, welcome to Bolingbrook Church. We are so happy that you chose to worship with us today. As you're watching, we would love for you to interact with each other, encourage each other, and definitely continue to share this live stream so that we can continue to reach the people with the life-saving message of God. And if you're joining us today for the first time or the second time, we wanna know how we can serve you better. So just click on the link in the description bar called Next Steps Card. If you're watching today with kids, we wanna remind you that we have great kids programming over at Disciple Town Kids. And you'll find that at our church YouTube page or the Disciple Town Kids Facebook page. It's just a great way for your kids to learn about God as they sing, do crafts, and hear Bible stories. And now as we begin worship, we just encourage you to slow down and be open to the message that God wants you to hear today. Ah, good morning. Let's take some time to sing about our faithful God. Here we go. I call you, I call you faithful. Your name is faithful. You are so faithful to me. I call you faithful. Your name is faithful. Faithful you are and faithful you'll be. A oh, really simple song. If you serve a faithful God, Sing it this morning. Here we go. I call you, I call you faithful. Your name is faithful. You are so faithful to me. To me? I call you faithful. Your name is faithful. Faithful you are and faithful you'll be. Yeah. Chains, I'm a prisoner no more. 
darkness rejoiced as though heaven had
As we continue to worship together, I want to invite you to pause with me for a moment, silence all the worry, all the distraction, everything that's waiting for you on Monday, and enter with me in the presence of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much that even though there are so many things that are going wrong in the world around us, even though there are so many disruptions and things that cause us fear, it's my prayer for my brothers and sisters who are listening to this that you would fill them with a holy faith, fill them with holy courage, fill them with holy boldness, that as we continue to go through these many disruptions in our lives, whether it be COVID or illnesses or fires or earthquake or any natural disaster that's going on, whether it be the rhetoric that's going on in our country, Father, it is my prayer that you would first and foremost fill each one of us with a spirit of peace, of courage, and of grace. Allow us to be able to navigate these moments that when we look back at this time in Earth's history, that it would be a testimony of your goodness and how you walked alongside us and we were not shaken. Be with us now. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Hey, Bolingbrook Church. I'm so excited that I get to be here this morning to share a word that I believe God has given me to share. I want to thank Pastor David for the opportunity to have me. Um, and we're just going to jump right into the word. Um, so take out your device, whatever, if you're using a Bible, a phone, uh, whatever you're using, go ahead and pull it out uh, because we're going to jump right in. We're going to be reading from the book of Acts chapter 9, 1 through 15, and it reads like this. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could not see. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. Pray with me. God, I just want to take this moment to invite you in. 
I invite you into this space and I pray that whoever is hearing hears and sees exactly what it is that you need them to hear and see. In your name I pray, amen. Now, most of you don't know, but I was raised in Puerto Rico. Most of my foundational years, I spent living two houses down from my paternal grandparents. And I was a granddaddy's girl. I don't know if that's a thing, but it is a thing for me. Um, we had such a special relationship, my grandfather and I. I have so many beautiful memories of him. And when we left Puerto Rico and moved to New Jersey, there was no FaceTime or Skype or anything like that. So we had weekly phone calls and he would sing to me. We would talk on the phone he would play his harmonica or musical family and he played his guitar and it was just an amazing uh, relationship so my junior year in high school when he was he became ill he had been in and out of the hospital many times but this one particular time I remember it was serious enough that my dad booked us tickets to go to Puerto Rico within the week Two nights before we're about to leave, we're packing, and as it was custom, they were they would call us from the hospital every single day. Um, my grandfather asked to talk to me, and so I talked to him this night, and I said, you know, I can't wait to see you. He told me he loved me, and right before I gave my the phone to my dad, he said to me, Leilani, um, no matter what happens, never stop trusting in God. Never lose your faith. Trust God for all things. And I said, of course, of course. Hung up the phone um, and I continued packing because we were getting ready to go. Not even five minutes later, the phone rings again. I thought it was weird because I had just hung up the phone, but I wanted to know what was happening. So I walked out of my room and I was eavesdropping and all I heard was my dad say, how? We were just talking to him. In that moment, my heart broke because I knew that my grandfather had passed. I don't know about you, but have you ever had a defining moment in your life? Uh, a moment, a turning point that's so significant that you know that life will never be the same. A split in your story. That defining moment, my, father, my grandfather passing away was that defining moment for me. It, I, I was never the same after that. It led me into a pretty long bout with depression. Um, it led me to leave the church, to be angry at God, because if God was loving, why would he cause this to happen? Now, at the time, uh, through a series of events, this same moment allowed me to have my own conversion with Christ because I had been worshiping the God of my parents. And so uh, just like Saul, I had a very similar experience. And so the story we're delving into today is a story about a moment in time, about a defining moment, a turning point that becomes a catalyst that changes the world. Now, uh, if you grew up in church, you are probably familiar with Saul's conversion. I mean, it's one of the most defining moments in Christianity, right? So let's give a little background to who Saul was. Saul was a Pharisee uh, who for years made it his mission to correct what he wholeheartedly believed to be false teaching within the church, right? Within Judaism, which was that Jesus was the Messiah, that he came, he died, he rose, and that worship to Jesus was superior to worship in the temple. Now, if this was a movie, we'd probably look back and see a little boy who was born in Tarsus to Greek-speaking parents. Now, I want to give you some context to what was happening uh, in the culture of the day because uh, it says that Saul was a Greek-speaking Jew, who lived in Jerusalem. Now there's a difference between Hebrew speaking Jews in Jerusalem and Greek speaking Jews in Jerusalem. You see those who spoke Hebrew and the true Jewish language were born in Jerusalem. Whereas those who were Greek speaking Jews were considered immigrants. They had migrated into Jerusalem and were born outside of that city. And so as a result of that, they were second-class citizens, right? They were considered to be outsiders. And as a result of that, you know, there was probably, you can assume that there was some dislike, maybe some suspicion by those who were born in Jerusalem. So Saul's in an interesting predicament. He was born in Tarsus, he speaks Greek, he is a Greek-speaking Jew, but he moves to Jerusalem at some point and is being taught by a Jerusalem teacher. 
but he's also a Roman citizen <laughs> because Tarsus was part of the Roman province. So talk about an identity crisis, okay? Having to grow up knowing that you aren't quite like everyone else. Where do you fit in? Who do you assimilate to? Now, the Bible indicates, right, based on his story, that he assimilated to the culture of Jerusalem. Acts 22 we, he, we see Saul talking about his teacher, Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was not just any teacher of the law. He was like the teacher, okay? He was Pharisee of Pharisees, rabbi of rabbis. He was one of the most powerful. Uh, he was one of the first to gain the highest title in the Sanhedrin. And for someone who's trying to literally belong, right? Trying to figure out where do I fit in Studying under the Pharisee of Pharisees brought Saul closer to what likely, um, what he probably wanted to be seen as, which was a born and raised in Jerusalem Jew. So with that backdrop in mind, um, we, we see him literally on the road to Damascus with letters in hand to go persecute the very people that Jesus was calling. And we see this to be his defining moment, his turning point. The Bible says that meanwhile, while he was still breathing out murderous threats. I just wanna stop right there because uh, <laughs> it shows the grace of God that while we were yet sinners, we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So while Saul is still breathing out these murderous threats, he has a defining moment. But how many of us can relate to the season of still, right? I'm still stuck. You know you're supposed to leave that job, but you're still working there. You're in a relationship that you have no business being in, but you're still messing around with that person. You are praying for deliverance and for healing, but you're still doing the things that got you there in the first place. You know the season of still, still afraid, still stuck in the past, still struggling, still doubting still being unwilling, still signifying a lack of change and a lack of movement. But can I tell you something that if you are still breathing, God can change your season of still to a season of now, to a season of go, to a season of movement. And that is the power of God in your story. See, God was getting ready to rewrite Saul's story in a way that would forever change him. Acts 9, 8 tells us that when Saul gets up from the ground after, right, he experiences this crazy light, he opens his eyes and he sees nothing. The Bible says that for three days he was blind. He did not eat. He did not drink anything. You see, Saul's main goal was to protect the word of God. Everything he did and condoned was to correct false teaching and to make sure that the system of the law remained intact and undefiled. This moment in his story reveals that Saul was now physically blind, but he had been spiritually blind all along. He believed in God. Saul believed in God. But he had anchored his faith in the law. He had anchored his faith in, tradi in tradition. Sometimes God has to take away your sight in order to help you to really see. I'm going to say that again. Sometimes God has to take away your sight in order to help you really see. Because as long as you can rely on your own senses, on your own abilities, on what you think you already know, it's really hard to hear and to see what God desires you to see. So he takes away his sight and Saul is left in darkness. And how many of us know that darkness has a way of turning us inward? Darkness has a way of silent, of heightening silence. And when you heighten silence, you heighten your own inner voice, your thoughts. You have to face and look at things that you have not wanted to look at in a long time. I mean, think about uh, nighttime when you're about to go to sleep, right? And everything is off. The lights are off. You are cozy. You are about to turn in for the night and you hear silence. 
and then all of a sudden you start hearing every creak and crack, every bang and bump and knock. I can't tell you the amount of times that I have had my husband get up in the middle of the night to check out a sound because I know I wasn't going crazy, but there was something in the house. The moment that Saul's in darkness, it causes the silence to turn him inward. And for Saul, this moment, this moment of darkness heightens this very thing. Except that for Saul, there was really no way of knowing if he was ever going to see again, if he would ever get out of this darkness. So in the darkness, when there's nothing else you can do, what do you do? Do you choose to anchor yourself in God or do you wallow in the loss? Do you wallow in the silence? Do you wallow in that darkness? On the road to Damascus, Saul experiences a turning point. He knew and he believed that it was the end of something and the beginning of something new. But Saul chose to anchor in Christ. And the reason why I know this is because the Bible tells us that Jesus is telling one of his disciples that he will find Saul praying. Every story has a defining moment. And the question is, will you allow God to be your anchor so that he can rewrite your story? Will you trust God in the darkness? Will you allow the silence to turn you inwards so that you can reflect, repent, consider, evaluate? And this is what Saul does. He anchors himself in God and begins to turn inward. I can't even begin to imagine what he must have felt. Because for the first time, he's beginning to see something new, right? For the first time, he's realizing that he is single-handedly responsible for persecuting the people that Jesus wants to use to build his church. So can you imagine the shame, the guilt, the remorse? Here's the thing. Shame breeds in silence. (laughs) It's why the devil will do everything everything in his power to keep you trapped, believing the lies that you're not good enough, believing the lies that you'll never fit in, believing the lies that who you are and what you've been through does not matter, that it is insignificant. Here's what's crazy, that the enemy believes more in what God can do through your story than what you believe God can do through you. It's why he wants to keep you trapped. Because he knows that if God can get a hold of your story, then there's no stopping you. He wants to keep you from experiencing the light of Christ's power. But I hope that today you know that if God says it, if God declares it, if he promises it, then there's nothing that the enemy can do. So as Saul sits in this darkness, I believe he starts to see something he could not have seen before, that Jesus was in fact the Messiah, that he had died and obviously rose because Jesus himself spoke to him, and that he was calling his followers to be light bearers to a world in darkness. Jesus was transforming Saul's heart in the darkness to see something he had not seen before but he was also equipping him for those he was going to be calling him to. Acts 9.15 says that Jesus tells Ananias, one of his devout disciples, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. There is someone assigned to your story. The question is, will you own it? You remember earlier we talked about Saul being a Greek-speaking Jew? Well, Saul didn't know it at the time, obviously, but God saw this group of people, this group of people who were marginalized, considered second-class citizens, who, who didn't know where they fit in, who needed to receive the gospel, who needed to see representation, who needed to see someone in who they could relate Someone who could understand what it meant to constantly have to try and be something they're not. How tiring is it to constantly put on, to constantly try to be something you're not? And Saul, a Greek-speaking Jew, would be this person. The event in Saul's life were creating a path all along 
to the story that God would use to bring freedom and salvation to the Gentiles. However, in order for this to take place, Saul had to own his story. For Saul to carry out the call over his life, he was going to have to own his story, the part of his life that he was likely ashamed of, the part of his life that he was trying so hard to conceal. And I say that because the people he was constantly surrounded by very likely made it clear that Greek-speaking Jews weren't good enough. Now, they could be around, they could learn, um, they could even learn Hebrew, right? The true Jewish language. They could worship together, but they would never truly be Hebrew-speaking Jews. And the Bible doesn't tell us much about this. However, if I can speculate for a second, okay, based on history, based on the Bible and human psychology, His zeal makes so much sense. You see, when we see a lack in ourselves, our human tendency is to want to hide it. Our human tendency is to want to cover the insecurity. Our tendency is to hide that part of our story so that hopefully nobody will ever see it. We overcompensate. (laughs) We overcompensate. And so Saul... I see it. I see it here, right? He's going the hardest. And it's funny because when I was doing research, you know, uh, scholars are not necessarily, they can't pinpoint exactly why Saul was so gung-ho about protecting the law, but it makes sense to me, right? And so if I can assume he was overcompensating for what he felt was a lack. He was going the hardest. He was being the strictest. He was being the meanest so that no one could ever question his validity. No one can ever question his loyalty. No one could ever question whether he was really a juju, right? Was he really uh, the person that he wanted to be and that he was putting out to be? But as he tried to run from that part of his life, (laughs) God in this defining moment of his life was asking him to run towards it. A Greek speaking Jew, an outsider. He was asking him to embrace this part of his life that he had struggled with, that he might have uh, felt ashamed over. The same goes for you. In order for you to carry out the will of God over your life, you have to own your story. You have to face the darkness. You have, to, you have to be willing to sit in front of the shame and deal with it head on, to let God into that part of your story so that he can heal it. Because if you don't own your story, no one will. If you don't value your story, no one will value it. If you don't believe, then how will someone else believe? And here's the power in What God did on the road to Damascus is that Saul then owns his story. And the reason why I know that is because the Bible starts calling Saul Paul. Now, let me tell you why that's significant. Many people believe that Saul's name was changed to Paul on the road to Damascus. Now, that's not true. And here's why it's not true. If God would have changed his name, then he would have been called Paul immediately after that. But scriptures don't use his name, Paul, until four chapters later in Acts 13. You see, Saul was Paul and Paul was Saul. Acts 13, 9 says that Saul is also known as Paul. And so I I know that um, we know that his name was not changed because Saul was his Hebrew name and Paul was his Greek name. The Bible still calls him Saul after this experience on the road to Damascus and continues to call him Saul all throughout the next four chapters. Acts chapter 13, 2, we see that Saul and Barnabas are worshiping with other believers and the Holy Spirit comes and says, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. They placed their hands on them and sent them off. Then it's in Acts 13, 13, where he's called Paul for the first time. And guess what? This is that moment. This is the moment that God had set him apart for, for the, from the beginning of time. The moment that Saul decides to own the part of himself that he might have been trying to hide. The, the moment where he decides to share and dedicate 100% of his ministry to the Gentiles as a Greek-speaking Jew 
to a Greek speaking nation. And it says that the followers of Jesus were first called Christians in Antioch. And what was Antioch? A Greek speaking city. Your story is bigger than you. Your story is bigger than you. Your story is your witness. It's your testimony. It's what Jesus came to do. I mean, he came to model for us what he wanted us to do, to share his story of his father. And then he calls his disciples to do the very same. Now you go and share of the experience with me. You go and share of the healing. You go and share of the restoration. You go and share how I turned your shame into victory, how I brought light into your darkness to be a bridge for those who would never see me, but believe because you believe. But this requires you to anchor in Christ, to own the part of your story that you've been trying to hide. Now, God is not asking you to share from a place of completion. Well, my story isn't finished. Um, Nobody's going to want to hear what I have to say. Um, I'm too afraid. What about the people that are part of the story? God isn't asking you to figure it out. God is asking you to surrender your story to him, to anchor in him and to let him lead you on how he wants you to use your story. In letting him use your story, his glory is revealed. We see 2 Corinthians 4, 7, where Saul says, but we have these treasures in jars of clay to show that this all surpassing power is from God and not from us. You see, if these jars were gold, then they would attribute the value to the jar. But instead, Paul references jars of clay, ordinary, fragile, easily broken, so that the value and the people are drawn to the Jesus in our story, not to the vessel. Our brokenness is not a liability. It's an opportunity. Your story is meant for good to carry out God's call over your life. See, God is more invested in your story than you are. Because when God gets a hold of your story, it's never just for us. When you allow God into your story, the people who are a witness to that story begin to believe that if he did it for you, he can do it for me. Your story is hope for someone. Your story is the compass that someone needs in order to also anchor in Christ. And I know this because Acts 9, 7 tells us that Saul was not alone on this road to Damascus. In fact, the Bible makes a mention of the men. He says, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. As God begins to transform your story, as you anchor in him and let him in, as you begin to embrace and face the darkness, recognizing that your story matters, you become a part of transforming the lives of others simply by sharing that story, living it out for him and in him. When we decide to anchor ourselves in God, his light will reveal all those dark places in our hearts that need to be molded. But that molding and reshaping can't take place without us first leaning in. Our job as followers of Jesus is not to control the narrative out of fear. It's to simply let God into our story. Anchoring ourselves in the truth that he can and will heal, that he can and will restore, that he can and will provide, that he can and will complete, so that he can use your story to lead you to the nations. And for you, the nations might be your dentist. It might be your coworker, your neighbor, your sibling, your child, your parent. Now, you probably look at your story. I mean, I'm sure there's some of us that look at our stories and just see pain. We see heartache, confusion, trauma. But listen, I promise you that if you anchor in Christ and surrender your story to God, like Saul did, he'll give you new sight. He'll give you new meaning. 
Paul's story had power, not just because of his conversion and what his conversion led to, but because of who God formed him to be. Your story matters because God says it matters, period. Your story matters because God says that it matters. So today, I'm inviting you to surrender your story, to anchor yourself in Christ, to face the darkness, to recognize that a call has been placed over your life that requires you to own your story. And like Paul, let him take your story through whatever door he desires and watch how his life is glorified through you so that like Paul, you too can hear God say and live out 2 Corinthians 12, 9. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. My power is made perfect in darkness. My power is made perfect in shame. My power is made perfect in insecurity. So therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest How's it going, Bolingbrook Church family? Thank you so much for watching with us today here at Bolingbrook Church. And thank you so much, Leilani, for sharing that amazing word about sharing our stories, owning our stories, because God is continually wanting to write a new chapter in our lives. And the amazing thing is that at the end of days, the Bible says that we overcome uh, the devil with the blood of the lamb and the words of our testimony. That is our story that through our story of knowing how God has worked in our lives, we can share that with the world and bring freedom to other people. And so if you feel God is calling you to write a new chapter in your life, if he's calling you to start over, maybe that is through baptism. We ask you to fill out the link in the description below under next steps and make that decision of baptism a reality. See what God is going to write in your new chapter of your life. Every first Saturday of each month, we will have our baptism pools open. We've had them open all summer, and we've even made contingencies and, and, and exceptions for people that wanted to do it on third weekend. And if you are feeling God calling you to baptism, fill out the link in the description below and make that decision a reality. Last week, we had our new friends, Leah and Weston, give their lives in baptism to Christ for the first time. And we're so thankful that all of you have welcomed them into the family. So again, don't delay your decision for God to write a brand new chapter in your life. And really like what the series that we're going through right now, be anchored in his trust, be anchored in, his, in the faithfulness um, that he's asking you to, to, to have in him. And so make sure you fill out that link in the description below under next steps. We also want to invite you to continue to watch our Sharma series, Anchored. And Anchored is a series where we get to practically see the ways that we can deepen our relationship with Christ each and every single day. So continue to watch with us as we invite our friends from all around the nation to be able to share in their ways of, of helping us learn practically to deepen our relationship with Christ. We also want to invite you to our connection events every single month. Last week, last month we had a connection event that unfortunately got rained out and it was our movie night, but fear not, it's coming back in August. August 15th, we're having our movie night where we wanna invite all of you and even your friends to our backyard where we get to sit uh, amongst the stars and, and hopefully great weather to enjoy the last bits of summer with each other with some popcorn uh, and some simple concessions and bring your lawn chairs, bring a friend, bring our family. Uh, just come with us on our lawn, 301 East Mountain Road, and enjoy a night under the stars watching a movie with all our church family here. We also want to connect you to our prayer line that happens each and every single week. On Monday mornings at 7.30 a.m., we get together and we pray together, start our weeks off together in prayer and hearing each other's triumphs as well as our trials and lifting all of them up to God because God gives us our trials as well as our triumphs and we want to celebrate and pray each other through every single moment. If you can't join us on Monday morning at 7.30 a.m., Join us on our Facebook page, Bolingbrook Church Push Line, where you get to engage with people there and share your requests and share your burdens, but also share your, your successes and your victories. And we will celebrate and pray with you.
If you can't do that, if you're not on Facebook and you can't join our line on Monday, go to our website, bolingbrook.church, and you can share a prayer request on our homepage where we will be praying over that request con consistently with our prayer team. We also want to invite you to our newsletter on our website, bolingbrook.church, to sign up to see all the upcoming events that's happening here at Bolingbrook Church. We also want to thank you so much for continuing to give to the ministry and the mission that we have here at Bolingbrook Church. If you don't know, if this is your first time joining us today, our mission here is to create spaces for the people that God missed the most. And we want to open up many more spaces to allow people to not only worship God, but ex experience Him in new ways. And one of those ways that we saw so much momentum and traction is our Family and Friends Sabbath. And what Family and Friends is, is where we close our doors and open up our homes to be able to worship with friends and family together at home, studying the Bible and also connecting. So if you feel God is calling you to be a Family and Friends host this year, please, 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 we'd love to have you on board as part of the team in that ministry to reinvigorate it and really push for more momentum of, of connection outside of our building. If 2020 and 2021 as far as anything is that God can, can continue to work outside of these walls and really push for more spaces for more people. So make sure you sign up in the link in the description below or on our website to become a host leader for Family and Friends Sabbath coming this August. We also want to invite you to our Serve Saturdays that happen each and every single month. And what Serve Saturdays are, are is a time where we focus all of Saturday to helping the community around us. We've had things like our food pantry open with a free car wash to the community. We've had our blood drive and as well as our partnership with Feed My Starving Children, which is an organization that helps feed hungry children all across the world. And so this coming this Saturday right now is a time where we're going to back to Feed My Starving Children and we made the request to have 70 spots booked for Bolingbrook Church members to be able to help pack food for hungry children across the world. And guess what? We have filled all 70 spots. So congratulations, thank you so much for helping us and we couldn't have done it without you. Don't worry if you want to continue helping us with our Serve Saturdays. Our next one is August 28th, where we will be opening our blood drive. And our blood drive is to help accommodate and give blood and vital resources like plasma to the surrounding hospitals where they have a blood shortage every single summer. And they desperately need more people to donate blood uh, for the hospitals around the area, including Bolingbrook Hospital. So make sure you come to our church here at, uh, on August 28th from 8 a.m. to 12 noon where you can give donate your blood to the surrounding hospitals in the area. We would love to have you here and love to support the local area hospitals. We want to thank you so much for giving to the church of your resources as well. You can give online, uh, Zell Quick Pay at info at bolingbrook.church to our website, bolingbrook.church forward slash giving, or you can text to give as well. Thank you so much for partnering with us here at this church and furthering the mission of creating spaces for the people that God missed the most. Thank you so much for all your help and support. We can't wait to see you again. We'll see you every first and third Saturday out on our lawn uh, all of August. We'd love to see you there. Thank you. Take care and God bless.